So this is the research that I've been working on since last weekend. I titled this presentation an update on the all-in sustaining costs of the three largest and lowest cost primary silver miners in the world. And those three silver miners, in my humble opinion, are Fresneo, which is a very large primary silver producer and also a large gold producer down in Mexico, listed on the London Stock Exchange, Pan American Silver, which is listed, I believe, on the New York Stock Exchange symbol P-A-A-S, Peter, Alice, Alice, Sam, and then also First Majestic Silver, which is symbol AG, which is the periodic table of elements symbol for silver. That's Keith Newmeyer's company. So this short video, which I spent over three hours of research on, in addition to recording the audio here, and later I'm going to be doing the editing. So there's a lot of work put into this. Hopefully you guys are appreciative. Let's start the presentation. And as you guys can see on the date, I started compiling the information over last weekend, and I've spent a good amount of time on this. Okay, before we do the analysis, I have to do, of course, the stupid disclaimer now. Everything discussed in this short video is only my opinion and is for informational and educational purposes only. I am not a financial advisor, so please do your own individual due diligence and contact your financial advisor to weigh your goals, risk tolerance, and objectives before investing or trading. And first of all, I would like to say that in the alternative media space, uh, me and Steve St. Angelo are really the only people that are putting out this type of research. Okay, so I went through the Fresneo investors presentations and also some of their financials and this was one of the most pertinent slides that i could find for you guys this is very important so i put the blue arrow there on the screen to highlight this and fresneo is long been considered one of the largest and lowest cost primary silver miners in the world and they're listing their per silver ounce equivalent which is really non-gap but i think it's pretty accurate now, it's a huge improvement compared to what the industry used to report with the cash costs. And for an example of that, Fresneo listed their cash costs on all of their mines for a dollar an ounce or lower. So really, there's you can't get any useful information from that. If they're going to list their cash costs for a dollar an ounce or lower on their cash costs for producing silver, and then you look at their financial statements, their income statement, their balance sheet, their statement of cash flows, and their earnings reports, you're just going to see that those don't match. And what's closer to reality, although in my opinion not exactly reality because they're still understating costs, is the all-in sustaining cost number. So I had to go through Fresneo's investors' presentations to pull this out. And Fresneo is producing silver, as you can see here on the, on the slide, at a little over $10 an ounce. And even though metals prices have you know not done so well lately and oil prices have risen, they've done a pretty decent job controlling their costs. The costs have not risen massively, as you can see by the slide. Although on their gold costs, it looks like their gold costs to produce gold have gone up, but they've been producing more gold, so maybe they're producing more marginal gold because more of the revenue is going to gold. And I think it's important to also note that at the bottom there, it lists what's inside the all-in sustaining costs. Fresneo is actually doing a good job of this, and a lot of the other companies in primary gold and silver miners are not listing what is contained in their all-in sustaining costs. So I, I would commend Fresneo for doing this. However, if you look at Fresneo's earnings, I would say that Fresneo's earnings don't really match the per ounce silver, silver equivalent cost because Fresneo should have around four, uh, when we're recording this on Friday, September 21st, 2018, gold prices are fighting to stay at $1,200 an ounce at or above $1,200 an ounce. Uh, earlier today, they were a little bit below $1,200. Now they're right around there. And silver is slightly above $14 an ounce at, I believe, $14.33. 33 cents the last time I looked at it. So according to these numbers, Fresneo should have around $4 an ounce free cash flow margins if you believe they're all in sustaining costs for silver production. And that's not counting their, their gold production there. And Fresneo produces over 50 million ounces per year of silver. So the math is not that hard. If you have around $4 an ounce of free cash flow margins and you're producing over 50 million ounces of silver per year you should have almost 200 million dollars in free cash flow per year and if you look at the financials for fresneo they're not indicating that so fresneo is not really in any danger of bankruptcy necessarily but they're also not immensely profitable and if you believed in the cash cost numbers you would think if you didn't look at any of the other information if you only looked at the cash cost numbers which i told you guys are not accurate 
they're not close to reality, you would think that Fresnio was one of the richest and most profitable companies in the world because they'd be, basically be minting money if their real costs were only a dollar an ounce to produce silver or lower. So it's just not reality. The reality is closer to the all-in sustaining cost number that we have in the slide. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide. This is Pan American Silver. I pulled this off of their September 2018 presentations. So I would like to commend Pan American Silver. If you look at the, if you look at the graphs, excuse me, that Pan American Silver has actually done a very good job improving operating margins. And what that tells me is that management is working very, very hard, very diligently to get the operations at the mine as efficient as possible. You know, cut the costs improve the margins, do as best as you can. But what we see though, over the last couple of years in the all in sustaining cost metric is that the all in sustaining costs are struggling to go lower. So while operating margins have increased, as you can see on the, on the slide here, by the way, this is all non-GAAP. So if you see in the footnotes there, this is non-GAAP. However, I think these, these are more close to reality than the cap, a lot more close to reality than the cash cost. But Pan American Silver, especially with oil prices rising and metals prices falling, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to continue to improve operating margins and also reduce those all in sustaining costs because they're just not going to have the margins. They're not going to have the free cash flow. And mines do produce a lot of cash flow. As I've said in the live stream recently, one of my couple of live streams, mines produce a lot of cash flow. The problem is that mines do not produce a lot of free cash flow. So mines produce cash flow, but they do not have they have very, very high fixed costs and very, very high maintenance capex. And Seth Klarman, in his excellent book, Margin of Safety, he's a value investor, which you can download for free if you look on the internet hard enough. He explains why companies like car companies and factory companies like Boeing and car companies and also mining companies have very, very high maintenance capex and it's so tough for them to maintain margins. So they can have cash flow, but their margins are going to be tough. And as you can see that I put in the red there, the red letters, that all in sustaining costs are not rapidly falling anymore. So all in sustaining costs fell for Pan American Silver from 2015 from $14.49 an ounce down to, well, they're saying $7.79 an ounce for the first half, but you're going to see later in the presentation in the next couple slides that that's just not the case. So they listed that the first half was that good, but then they're giving a, a guidance range uh, above that number there on the slide of $8.50 to $10 an ounce. So they're, they're giving a guidance range, but the $7.79 number I don't think is really too accurate, and you'll see that in the next couple slides. Okay, so on to the next slide. So this is the first half 2018 numbers and guidance for Pan American Silver. Again, I would caution you guys to look at the footnotes that all this stuff is in non-GAAP and there's assumptions here, okay? But they are trying to be more transparent compared to other mining companies and also compared to the entire industry in the past. So there is an improvement here. The industry does need to get more transparent, but there is definitely an improvement here. Okay, so I would note a couple things. They've highlighted some of them. So copper production is down. Copper prices have fallen in 2018. They're down, I think, 20% in 2018. All in sustaining costs, and this is the most important thing, they're claiming that all in sustaining costs for the first half of 2018 was $6.71. Yeah, we're, we're going to see that that's just not true. So this $8.50 to $10 all in sustaining costs guidance that they're giving, actually the guidance that they're listing is a higher number, but that guidance was given at the beginning of this year. So they're saying that they've they've lowered their costs a little bit, but I, I honestly think that they're not gonna be able to lower their costs much more because oil prices have risen a lot more since Q1 2018 when those numbers came out and also metals prices for gold and silver and also base metals have fallen. So that they're gonna have margin pressure. They're gonna have margin compression. They're gonna have their margin squeeze. And ultimately that means they're just not gonna have the free cash flow. But as you guys can see also on the slides, that sustaining capital, which is maintenance capital, same similar thing, that Pan American Silver is on track to put in over $100 million in maintenance capex back into their mines. They're not going to the market and borrowing. One of the things about Pan American Silver is that they have not had to massively dilute their shares. Okay, so unlike many of the other mining companies, which are basically serial diluters, Pan American Silver has not gone out of its way to dilute their shareholders like crazy. Their balance sheet isn't loaded with tons of debt. 
Okay, on to the next slide. Okay, this is First Majestic Silver slide. This is the most important slide I found in the new First Majestic Silver presentation. For those of you who are not familiar, First Majestic Silver earlier this year had all in sustaining costs closer to $12 an ounce. And Keith Newmeyer, as I mentioned in another live stream, gave a presentation, I believe, in March of this year at the European Gold Forum in Switzerland. And he talked about how it would be very, very difficult for First Majestic Silver to lower their all in sustaining costs below 12 because they needed a higher silver price so they could have better margins so they can invest their free cash flow into the other investments to lower their costs. Because mines have such high maintenance capex, it's tough to make the additional capital investments without the miner either taking on a lot of debt or diluting their shareholders. And First Majestic Silver, after that Keith Newmeyer did that presentation, pretty shortly after that, I think within two months, they did a very big acquisition. They bought the San Dimas mine from Primero as Primero was trying to stave off bankruptcy. So First Majestic did buy a really quality asset. However, First Majestic, to get the Silver Stream agreement off, they had to make a deal with Weed and Precious Metals, and that involved a lot of stock dilution. So First Majestic Silver has a lot of maintenance capex, and they have a lot of hard work to do to optimize the mine. So they've taken on a lot of risk at Sandemus. Hopefully they can optimize that mine, but the rewards, if they execute on their business plan, the rewards could be good, but the risk is going to be higher than it would be for say Pan American Silver or Fresneo. And if you look at the slide here, you see that all in sustaining costs for First Majestic Silver are much higher now than the all in sustaining cost number that Keith Newmeyer was touting earlier this year at 12. So all in sustaining costs now, they're guiding between $14.53 and $15.83. And in my opinion, that's probably, as you'll you'll see in, in the next couple slides, you'll see that they're underestimating their costs a little bit. And this is a problem in general with the mining industry. And even though, based on my research, that Fresneo and Pan American Silver are the two lowest cost producers, there is, if you look through their investors' presentations, there is some cost discrepancies on their all in sustaining costs. And I think the way they get around this and some of their estimates is because everything is non-GAAP. And so there's in different cost estimates, there's different assumptions and there's different things included or not included. And also I would point out that there's also footnotes as well on the first Majestic Silver PowerPoint slide here as well. So there's some assumptions there. The San Dimas mine is not fully optimized yet. Plus there's now a gold stream on there instead of a silver stream. Okay, on to the next slide. The one thing I wanted to highlight here is First Majestic Silver Q2 2018 results are different from initial 2018 guidance. And a lot of this has to do with the acquisition. There's two main reasons, in my opinion, for this. So the one, the first main reason is First Majestic Silver did the acquisition of the San Dimas mine. It's a massive gold and silver mine. And it long term, if First Majestic Silver can optimize that mine, lower the cost, get the mine producing at a higher amount of gold and silver and lower the cost and, and um, build out the exploration and all the things you have to do at the mine, which are high, very capital intensive, a lot of maintenance capex, a lot of fixed asset investments, then First Majestic Silver's cost can come down. The other problem, and this is why First Majestic Silver's Q2 results for this year are different than their guidance from earlier this year in Q1, are because, like I said earlier, earlier in the short video, that Metals prices are down significantly from the beginning of this year and oil prices and diesel prices, which make up around a third or 33% of all mining costs, those prices are significantly higher. Oil prices, I believe, were closer to $50 to start the year and now they're closer to 70. So for mining companies, that is a big deal because they do not hedge, okay? They should, but they do not, when the oil price is low and there's panic in the street, they probably should hedge their oil costs, but they don't do it. And Keith Newmeyer, in a, a, an interview with me on my channel a couple years ago, I asked him that question, and he highlighted that basically it's a lot of upfront money to do it. So that's why a lot of miners are not going to do it. They would rather pay as they go. And this is the problem because then they cannot control their costs. So First Majestic Silver, in the second quarter of 2017, when they did not have the San Dimas mine, when metals prices were higher, when oil prices were lower, their own sustaining costs were closer to $14. Now their costs year to date are $16.25 an ounce. And their Q2 costs were $16.43. So... First Majestic Silver, if you go back and look at their financials, First Majestic Silver has not been consistently profitable in over a year. 
And one thing that I also would point out too, if you go and look through the financials of all three of these mining companies, whether it's Fresneo or Pan American Silver or First Majestic Silver, there's adjustments. Okay, so one thing that's important about looking at adjusted earnings is the company is experiencing some type of problem. So maybe they're not fully disclosing it. You'll have to look at the fine print. There may be footnotes. The CEO or CFO or chief operating officer may talk about some of the reasons why they did an adjustment on their conf on their conference call, or it could be in their financials where they're, they're going through some general comments about why. But normally what management tries to do, and sometimes it's honest and sometimes it's not, is they say these adjustments are a one-time thing. But what I would point out though, with a lot of these companies seeing adjustments is that they're saying that they're going to be they're going to have lower costs they're saying that they're going to have better margins they're saying that they're going to be profitable at a certain price but the adjustments are telling you if you see the word adjusted earnings normally it's adjusted earnings is that they're not hitting the numbers and there's some type of normally operational problem if it's another type of company it could be a, a currency trading problem a foreign exchange problem etc but normally with a mine the reason for the adjustment is that there's an operating problem okay on to the next slide so I pulled off some of the updates from the first Majestic Silver Q2 2018 results. And one thing I will highlight is that first Majestic Silver actually increased their revenues. So they increased their revenues. And I think this was before they added San Dimas. So first Majestic Silver is working hard to optimize things at the mine, grow revenues. The problem is that with that revenue increase, as you can see mentioned on the slides, their earnings did not rise. So they did not drastically lower their costs. They did not increase earnings. So they grew revenue and they did it They did it ineff inefficiently. And I think this is an industry-wide problem because normally First Majestic Silver is very efficient. They're known as one of the lowest cost producers. They have a really good team at, op at optimizing producing mines in Mexico. So they don't try diversification and try to get into a bunch of jurisdictions where they're not familiar. They don't try to do that. So what this is telling me is that First Majestic Silver is really, really struggling in spite of revenue increases to keep their all, to lower their all in sustaining costs and to maintain margins. And that's why they're not consistently profitable. And they haven't been consistently profitable if you go back and look at past financial releases in over a year. And the other thing is that First Majestic Silver has only a little over $100 million. So if things at San Dimas do not go according to plan, if you go back and look at first, how much cash First Majestic Silver is normally kept on their balance sheet, they normally always keep $100 million and they do not dip below it. So if there are problems at the San Dimas mine or some of their other mines, I would not be shocked if First Majestic Silver goes and does even more sheer dilution or they have to take on some debt. So that would be a potential another red flag. So there is execution risk in for First Majestic Silver. Okay, on to the next slide. So this is a question I'm posing to you. Can the primary silver miners reduce their all sustaining cost with oil prices rising a lot since the beginning, beginning of this year and metals prices falling significantly since the beginning of this year? And this is Keith Newmeyer's comments. Looking ahead to the second half of this year, we expect higher operating margins along with a significant reduction in our consolidated all in sustaining cost to between 1328 and 1484 per ounce. And then it's talking about the optimizations at the mine. Well, we'll see, we'll see. There's a lot of execution risk there. So if he can execute, you know, they'll hit the numbers. But there's a lot of risk if he does not. Because, you know, in the short term, silver prices could go lower. And oil prices could go higher. What the industry really needs is higher metals prices, higher gold and silver prices, and also much lower oil and diesel prices. And they have to stay there. Moving on to the next slide. So I have about five conclusion slides here for this video before I wrap it up. And so in addition to the PowerPoint slides that I pulled out for research, I'm going to give you guys more analysis here. With higher oil diesel prices and lower gold and silver prices, the world's top three largest and lowest cost primary silver miners are struggling to maintain margins to remain profitable. Revenues are up since 2017, but profits are not. The same is for margins. So if you go and look at any of those three companies, you'll notice that. You'll also notice if you go through, through Pan American Silver's investor presentation that they're talking now about a flexible dividend. So what this tells me is that they're expecting a lot more weakness in the short term. But if 
those margins do improve or silver prices rise, then they will pay out more dividends. But the days of Pan American Silver routinely being the lowest cost producer, routinely being able to cut costs, routinely being able to uh, either maintain or keep their dividend and not cut it or remove it or eliminate it entirely are gone. For Fresneo, the basic and diluted EPS from continuing operations per share. Uh, okay, so Fresneo adjusted. This is what I talked about. Look, Fresneo stuff is down significantly, and Fresneo is the lowest cost. I think Fresneo's real costs are probably a dollar or two higher. So if you go and look at some of the earnings and their operating cash flow, I think Fresneo's real true silver costs are closer to around 12. And I think Pan American Silver's real costs as well are closer to 11 or 12. So basically, guys, if the silver price goes... We're at a little over 14 when we're recording this. If the silver price goes a couple dollars an ounce lower or has one enormous crash and it stays down there for a while, for a couple quarters or maybe even a year, that could be real, real trouble. That would be big problems for the lowest cost silver producers. They would probably have to tap the capital markets, but the higher cost silver miners with bad balance sheets and debt on their balance sheets, they'd be in real trouble. Okay, on to the next slide. So Pan American Silver is still profitable, although struggling to maintain profitability and margins despite lowering all in sustaining costs in the last few years. And if you look here, Pan American Silver had to adjust earnings too. So that means all these guys, whether it's Fresneo or Pan American Silver, and they're the, in my opinion, the, they're, the, they're the two largest and lowest cost primary silver miners in the world, Pan American Silver and Fresneo, they're even adjusting, okay? They're even adjusting their earnings. So that to me says that they're even having problems with their operations and also maintaining margins. So if the lowest cost guys are struggling, they're not going to go bankrupt. I don't expect Pan American Silver or Fresnio to go bankrupt, but they are having operational problems. They're having real problems cutting costs anymore and maintaining margins. Okay, on to the next slide. First Majestic Silver has not been consistently profitable for over a year now. For this recent quarter, they reported an adjusted net loss of $12 million. Long term, they seem to have made a smart acquisition of the San Dimas mine. However, in the short term, the extra capex needed to optimize that mine is causing the all sustaining cost to raise from around $12 an ounce earlier this year to over $16 an ounce now. And, you know, I don't see them being able to reduce that cost significantly. So they're claiming they're going to lower it a buck. That may be reasonable, but for them to lower their costs down $4 is going to be almost impossible given the current market conditions that we have for metals prices, for oil and diesel, and for base metal prices, and also for available capital for the miners. And one thing else to note is that First Majestic Silver had to do a massive stock dilution for the acquisition. The stock dilution was in addition to buying the mine from Primero, which they, they did buy the mine at a discount. The problem is and this is why they had to pay more, was they had to amend that uh, the silver streaming agreement with Wheaton Precious Metals. So Wheaton Precious Metals had a very onerous uh, silver stream on the San Dimas mine, one of the reasons why Primero could not fix the project economics. And so First Majestic Silver had to give Wheaton Precious Metals something, they had to sweeten the pot, and so they gave... They gave uh, shareholders of Wheaton Precious Metals shares of First Majestic Silver. I believe Wheaton Precious Metals now owns 10, at least 10% of the company of shares. And Wheaton Precious Metals also, instead of a silver stream, the agreement was amended to a gold stream. So long term, if First Majestic, there's a lot of execution risk here. And like I said, First Majestic Silver, if things do not go right at that mine, they only have $100 million in cash and it's a big mine. So if things don't go right there the way they planned, they may have to go back and dilute the stock even more. But if things go right and they get the cash flow right, they get the margins right on the costs, then the acquisition will pay off and First Majestic Silver will not have to dilute their shareholders even more. Okay, on to the next slide. Since late in 2017 to the beginning of this year, the cost for at least one of the world's three largest and lowest cost primary silver miners have begun to rise substantially. So First Majestic Silver's costs have begun to rise substantially, but if you look at the costs that Fresneo have put out and also Pan American Silver, they're having real, real problems being able to lower their own sustaining costs too much more. And yes, they've increased their operating margins, but there's limits to that. 
And that's because they just don't have the free cash flow. They don't have the cash and the margins to make the investments into other optimizations. So there's only so much, so many costs you can cut at the mine. I think the the other waste that is still there in a lot of these mining companies, and I don't think this is going to be really cut. And Rick Roll has talked about this. Is if is an SGNA, so selling general and administrative expenses, and the largest amount is how much the CEOs of these mining companies pay themselves. You know, a lot of these guys, unless they're Rob McEwen or Ross Beatty or Keith Newmeyer, a lot of these guys are not really rich necessarily, on their own at least. And so they need that large salary from running a publicly traded large mining company. So they're, I don't expect them to draft, to cut their, their salary or fire a bunch of vice presidents. Unfortunately, I don't see that, uh, that happening. So there aren't a lot of other ways for the miners to cut costs right now especially given what metals prices are and what the oil and diesel prices are and how much of the inputs are required and, and how much energy and diesel are required to run a mine. And revenues in production have increased for all three miners over the last year, but earnings are down for all three. So this to me demonstrates how difficult it is for miners to maintain or increase their margins. Okay, on to the next slide. So despite the all sustaining costs being an immense improvement, over the cash cost metric, and I highlighted what Fresneo's cash costs were. I don't, they're totally ridiculous. I can't believe they still report them. But there is a large discrepancy still between cash costs and all sustaining costs. And honestly, I don't think miners should report cash costs anymore because it just confuses most people. If you're if you're looking at companies, just ignore the cash costs. Only look at the all sustaining costs. So the world's three largest and lowest cost primary silver miners are either barely profitable, struggling to maintain decent margins, or losing money at current silver prices. And the adjusted earnings, so even for Pan American Silver and even for Fresnia, which are the two largest and lowest cost primary silver miners in the world, they're adjusting earnings. So that means they are not consistently profitable. There is operational problems. They are either taking a charge or some other type of type of hit, and you'd have to look maybe in the footnotes of the financial statements or for management to disclose it. And, you know, the thing with the costs, and people are wondering, like, how do they get away with, you know, the cost discrepancies? They disclose these things in the footnotes, okay? So all these things are non-GAAP. That's how they get away with it. So if you say, well, you lied about your costs or you weren't as honest or accurate as you should have been with your costs, they would point to that our lawyers and management disclose that all of these costs were non-GAAP, which means not 100% fully accurate in the investor's presentations and in the quarterly reports and in our financial statements. And so then the question is, is the current silver price environment sustainable for much longer? How can costs be further cut without making smart long-term investments that cost additional capital the miners don't have because of margin erosion compression and without oil and diesel prices falling significantly. So I think I think the miners maybe for another year, maybe for another two years can withstand this, but you know, two years from now, if silver prices aren't significantly higher and we're talking, man, we're talking $18. We're talking $18 because some of these miners, even First Majestic Silver struggling, that uh, a lot of these silver miners two years from now are, are going to be good. First of all, if there is a big rally in gold and silver, I think a lot of these miners, even the lower cost ones, may go back to the market and dilute like crazy. They may have no choice, especially for the management teams who want to keep their cushy jobs, who need the high salary. They're probably going to go back as soon as there's a big rally in gold and silver and they're going to dilute their shareholders like crazy. So Pan American Silver's annual mix of silver revenues is down to 47%. And their annual gold revenues are rising too, up to 25%. From what I remember, I don't know, about four or five years ago, I I believe that Pan American Silver's annual silver revenues were closer to 65% and their gold revenues were maybe 10. So I think their gold revenues have doubled, more than doubled, and their silver revenues, annual silver revenues are down significantly. So they're also diversifying into more gold production. And they're arguably... The lowest cost, them and Fresnia are the two lowest cost, largest and lowest cost primary silver miners in the world. And basically, you know, this is happening throughout the entire silver mining industry. So I've highlighted this many times on short videos and other commentary that Hecla, Coeur d'Alene, and SSR Resources are all also moving more of their annual revenues away from silver and into gold. 
And my analysis here is that none of these three miners will probably go bankrupt that were highlighted in the short video. But despite being lower cost primary silver producers, none of them are doing very well right now. So Fresneo and Pan American Silver, if, if you are a longer term investor and you can wait this out for a couple of years, and obviously this is not financial advice, this is just my opinion, that Fresneo and Pan American Silver are the two safest of the three. For some Majestic Silver, if they can get the San Dimas mine fully optimized at a higher production rate without share dilution, the all-in sustaining cost should fall quite a bit. Margins should improve, and they will become a safer business from an operational standpoint again. But if there's production problems at San Dimas and the mine is not upgraded on time and on budget, and as I've highlighted earlier in this video, there's execution risk, For some Majestic Silver only has around $100 million in cash on its balance sheet and will most likely dilute their shareholders more, which will not help the stock price and which will cause more short-term weakness in the share price. So then, you know, if you haven't bought into First Majestic Silver, and this is not financial advice again, stupid disclaimer, that, you know, maybe you should wait to see San Dimas. So if, you, if you're willing to take some risk, First Majestic Silver may be a more speculative, speculative play here. But I would definitely say that Pan American Silver and Fresno are safer. It looks to me like, that Pan American Silver and Fresneo are a lot safer with their financials, with their earnings, and also with their operations. Because the San Dimas mine, this is this is a problem with the mining industry. If things are not on time and on budget, the San Dimas mine is going to cause First Majestic Silver a lot of financial problems. Okay, on to the next slide. So these are just things that make you go, hmm, to wrap up the video. So $10 an ounce seems to be the absolute lowest all in sustaining cost that the world's largest and lowest cost primary silver miners can achieve given current metals prices, energy prices, and cost of capital or the availability of capital. And you know what? If silver prices stay, uh, if silver prices went below $10 an ounce, say to $8 an ounce, like in 2008, even though that wasn't the price that a lot of you guys were paying in 2008. I've talked about this as well because there for retail silver investors there was a four or five dollar an ounce premium then if silver goes to ten dollars an ounce or lower for it would have to be probably a year at least but if it stayed down there for a while this would potentially bankrupt most of the primary silver miners okay so my educated guess is that all in sustaining costs is still at least 20 percent understated by nearly every primary gold and silver silver miner given the poor shape of their financial statements and balance sheets and also that they're disclosing that they're making adjustments, claiming that earnings would be this if, if things, if uh, production was the way we said. Basically, you know, with these adjusted earnings and also that their earnings reports and also how much profit and earnings they're making are not matching their own sustaining costs. And for an example, Pan American Silver was claiming that they, they drilled like, they had like a $7 an ounce or for one one quarter earlier this year it was six or seven and then if you go and looked at other slides on their investors presentation it said that their range was higher and they get away with this because it's all non-gap and some of those estimates that say are six or that it's six or seven dollars an ounce to produce they're not including certain things so you have to kind of have the experience to go back and look through all the different slides and then compare that what they say in the slides versus what they released in their financial statements. And that's how you get to more accurate estimates, more accurate educated guesses of what their real costs are. So my, my estimates are that Pan American Silver's real costs are 11 or $12 an ounce in that range. And Fresneo's, like I said, is a little, uh, they're claiming it's a little above 10. I think it's 11 or 12 as well. And physical silver demand from India, China, and global industrial demand continues to be solid. And yet, despite a large spike in physical silver demand from India, the paper silver price actually still fell. That This just shows the manipulation in the market, right? Because if it was a rational market that was functioning properly in this everything bubble that we have where all asset prices except for gold and silver are through the roof, that with the extra demand increases from India, there was enormous, Louis Camersano Small Gold highlighted this, there was enormous increases in demand for physical silver in India, that that should have moved the price higher, but that's not what happened. As we all know here in the gold and silver community, gold and silver prices are really struggling. And in the short term, maybe they'll even go lower. A lot of it's going to depend on the dollar and what happens with the stock market. And finally, high copper base metal and silver prices will be needed in the next few years for miners to maintain current production levels. 
So I really think going forward over the next two or three years, it's going to be extremely difficult for a lot of primary gold and primary silver miners to maintain current production levels. People in the industry call this peak gold. I would just call it that there's problems with the price and the manipulation. I, I'm not sure if I would call it peak gold. I would just say it's a function of price and manipulated markets. So if you manipulate a market, it's a price control. So the type of manipulation that goes on, and I've explained this too in other interviews and short videos, the manipulation that goes on in gold and silver is a form of a soft price control. And when you control the price too much, then you're not going to be, you're going to run out of supply at certain levels. So at a certain point, probably a couple of years from now, the gold price is going to have to be $1,500 or $1,600 an ounce. And the silver price is going to have to be at least $18 to $21 an ounce, probably even $25, because a lot of the primary silver mines that have been found that are not economic right now, they need at least $25 an ounce silver, except for a handful of mines, especially the mag silver mine that Fresneo is helping develop in Mexico. So basically, you know, you're going to have to have higher metals prices or the supply levels are going to be constrained. And I've talked also about how like the higher copper price was being used to manipulate the, the silver market, the paper silver price. So the manipulators would have the physical metal, but could still manipulate the paper price of silver. But now you have a crash in the copper market. The copper market is down 20 percent. But we haven't seen any evidence yet that a lot of that copper production has come offline. So I would pay attention to that. I would look for news releases from some of these larger medium tier copper miners announcing that either they're shutting down a copper mine, they're reducing copper production, or they're going bankrupt and the mine is being shut down. Or they're putting the mine on care and maintenance. So they're maybe they're closing a uh, one of their higher cost marginal copper mines. Because those hedges for copper, the copper miner, I've explained this at length, the copper miners hedge everything. So those hedges, now that copper's been down for been going down for about a year, those hedges over the next year or two are going to start rolling off. So I think if that does happen and a lot of copper supply does come offline, that would mean a lot of silver byproduct would come offline and that would be good long term for silver. So we'll we'll have to watch and pay attention to that going forward. Okay, next slide. And finally, I just want to bring this up one more time. So it took well over three hours for me just to pull the information from the quarterly results and investors' presentations of the three companies featured in this PowerPoint presentation, and then to put the information into slides, combining that with my analysis so it's easier to understand for non-financial professionals. So this does not count me recording the audio analysis here, which is well over 20 minutes for the short video, and then also editing the audio and video, which is probably going to take me over an hour. So a lot of the audio snobs won't complain about some of my flubs and other stuff. And, you know, unfortunately, guys, over the next few months, short videos like these will probably end up being only available for my Patreon account contributors or behind a paywall on my website because I can't really afford to continue to spend and subsidize over $600 a month on audio editing and other you know things that I do for this channel without making a profit. And I did make some investments into Zencaster, but you know some of the other things that are required to produce really high quality audio content for you guys, they're not cheap. And you know some of you guys out there, you're you're calling me a crybaby, you're calling me a whiner, but you cannot it's not fair for you guys to expect me to produce Michelin star quality audio for free. It's just not and there's tons of other podcasts out there. Some of them have literally subsidized over $100,000 a year in losses, like Stansbury Radio on their first investors podcast that they tried. They wasted over $100,000 to produce that, and they canceled it the first time. And other people like Jason Stapleton, I think he spent over a couple hundred thousand dollars on his audio studio and then hired a full-time producer. But he had a profitable business, his Forex trading business, that he used to subsidize his podcast to build it up and i don't have that so unless there's a serious business partner or partners or a paid advertiser with a good product or service that my audience of lis listeners will actually like or a lot more patreon contributors are willing to step up for even chipping in a buck a month then things cannot continue as they are now and it'll be very tough to keep improving things i'm sorry guys this is the harsh reality of things I really don't feel like spending over $600 a month out of my own pocket to produce this content. And this is the type of research that mining analysts for investment banks normally work on. 
and is normally not available for free. So this video, the research and analysis is actually far better than 99.9% .9 of the investment bank mining industry research reports that I've read over the many years I've been covering the resource sector. You know, a lot of them don't really go through the cost base. If they do, they're only sharing it with with very high net worth individuals or hedge funds or other mining companies. So you, the retail audience, who are most of my listeners, will not have access to that. It's going to be really, really tough for the primary silver miners, even the, th the world's three largest and lowest cost ones, to get their costs much lower. We're getting very close here to big, big trouble, basically endgame for a lot of these primary silver miners, especially if the metals prices, gold and silver, go lower and oil and diesel either go higher, stay at this level, and do not fall. Because the, one of the basic ways for you guys to look at margins is to look at the metals price and then look at the oil and diesel prices. And that will give you a sense of where margins are. Because as I said, the miners do not hedge their oil and diesel prices. If they did hedge their oil and diesel prices at lower prices, the miners would be in better shape. There's a problem the industry is going to have to think about. They teach this in business school. This is fixed cost versus variable cost. So if you hedge your oil prices when oil was at $45 or $50 a barrel, if you hedge those, those would be fixed for three or four years if you hedge those out. You know, now the mining industry is pay as you go, and they don't know what the oil or diesel prices are going to be because they're paying as they go, and this is variable cost. And variable costs can get you in trouble. So the mining industry is hand to mouth, and they're pay as they go, and the variable costs are what's hurting their margins for a lot of these miners. Okay, well, that's it for this short video. I'm gonna wrap it up right now. Please like this video, share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.